Hello and welcome to Political Quickie, your political show that subjectively discusses current affairs in South Africa and all around the world. My name is Mop Asik Um The North Gauteng High Court um, has found that Sean Abrams' appointment as the National Director of Public Prosecutions is unlawful and it has been set aside. This is crazy considering that this guy is allegedly one of uh, Jacob Zuma's cronies and he has been holding back in terms of prosecuting Zuma um, in all his crimes. Um, so the High Court former found that, you know, the axing of the former NDPP Nkoli Singhasana uh, is invalid. And also he has been ordered to pay back that golden handshake he was given by Zuma, uh, that 17.3 million rands. So he has to pay back the man, in other words. Um, you know, in a normal setting, Zuma would be the one to appoint uh, the next national director of public prosecutions. But according to the court, he has a conflict of interest uh considering the fact that he is facing uh, you know those 783 uh charges of corruption money laundering and racketeering um so then they've ordered Cyril Ramaphosa the deputy president uh to appoint a an NDPP within a period of 60 days so yeah yeah so this could be the final nail in the Zuma story. Um, you know, his cronies coming up and saying that actually this is a judicial overreach. Um, that, you know, the judiciary is getting involved in politics um, uh, and it shouldn't do that. But actually, the whole point that we have three different arms of government, the judiciary, the legislature and the executive, is so that they can perform checks and balances on each other when the executive is as corrupt as it is right now then it's the job of both the legislature and the judiciary to ensure that it calls it to order and you know the parliament has been totally crippled in doing this because the executive has influence on it so the judiciary has been the ultimate rock star in trying to deal with the situation that we have in our hands uh, you know Calling the executive into order. I mean, we saw the and like case uh, order uh, Zuma having to pay back the money, and you know other cases as well as this one saying, "Nah, man, you cannot have this guy, Oshon Abrams, who's been appointed illegal." So yeah, very interesting case. Um, uh, you know, Zuma has got two cards that he can play. I mean, he can rally as much support as he can behind uh, Nkosa Zana Zamine Zuma and ensure that she gets elected um, as both the ANC president and the president of South Africa. Um, but also, he could just, you know, rig those ANC elections. But also, he's got another card to play. Um, he could offer Cyril Ramaphosa within this period of, what, less than five days, um, the ANC presidency. Lamine Zuma could drop out. He could ask her to do that. And then he could ensure that, you know, Ramaphosa becomes the next president of the ANC. In return, Ramaphosa could pick uh, an NDPP that will be very lenient towards uh, Jacob Zuma. But yeah, so if Ramaphosa does choose someone with integrity, someone who's honest, um, then... It, it could be over. This could be literally the final chapter in this whole uh, Gupta corruption uh, presidential saga. So, yeah, it'll be very interesting to see what happens next. Uh, as always, we'll keep our eyes fixed. We'll keep our eyes fixed. So, yeah. Yeah. On other news, um, let's have the Nelson uh, Mandela conversation. Um, so this is a very touchy-feely conversation because this man is like the beacon of forgiveness. Uh, he went ahead and decided to go and forgive all white people on behalf of all South Africans. Um, he's like everybody's grandfather. He is, um, you know, held in the highest esteem. And, you know, him and a lot of South Africans, a lot of them, we owe our freedom to. Um... So yeah, my main concern is the negotiations between the ANC led by Nelson Mandela and the apartheid government, which began in the mid-80s. Um, so the apartheid government decided to negotiate with the ANC, not 
that because contrary to you know the narrative that actually you know they had some sort of awakening and decided to end up at it no there was a serious threat of civil war that's when they decided okay let's negotiate and see how you know we can save our asses um you know the initial offer um was that nelson mandela must go back to Kono, uh sit there and not be involved in politics um you know in 1985 pw border said this he's like you know what we're considering um uh, releasing nelson mandela if he honors um the terms and conditions uh nelson mandela's like nah that is not going to happen. Um, I will not do that. I will not. And so uh, P.W. Bota later resigned. F.W. de Clark uh, took over as head of state. Um, you know what? I just, for me, I strongly believe that the compromise uh, on the ANC side and on, on the Freedom Fighter side was too great in those uh, negotiations. Um, the NC was hell bent on reaching some sort of agreement. I mean, we see that with Kadissa and the multi-party negotiating forum that happened later on. Uh, but for me, I, it just looks like uh, the black people got this political freedom. And the white people, as well as the apartheid government, got the economy and the land. And this is something that, you know, I can't fathom with African leaders is that they're always willing to compromise so much just, you know, for that political freedom. I mean, you look at um, Emerson Nangago right now and how he is going to compensate uh, white farmers whose land was um, taken back by Zimbabwe. But the thing is, um, you know, in the context of South Africa, looking at how Jan van Riebeck came to South Africa and later on white farmers uh, were allocated land. Land that did not belong to them. They just, they just poof, in South Africa and decided, nah, we will give you land here. And then because, you know, we can do such things. We are that powerful. Um, you know, just because um, that piece of land was kept generation after generation um, within... Uh, the group of those people does not mean then somehow it legitimizes uh, their ownership. No, it does not mean that it now belongs to them. You know, when we look back, it was taken, it was theft. And, you know, the apartheid laws of segregation and land ownership further solidified that. So that's something that I fail to fathom and I don't understand why African leaders will be like, you know, take the economy, take the land. We will just keep the political power and be corrupt in the process. So that's something that I just, I fail to understand. So um, the fact that South Africa is one of the most um, unequal countries in the world and the fact that white privilege persists in 2017 is the result of that compromise of saying, nah, we'll keep the political uh, freedom you keep the land and the economy, and that's actually where the real power is. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm super grateful for my freedom. I cannot imagine living in that time. And maybe those freedom fighters were just tired. Like, you know what, we are tired. Let's just keep the land, keep the economy. We'll just have, you know, we'll just keep the government. So um, I could never understand what was going on in their heads at that time. But what I'm saying is that right now, as a born free in this country today, for me, I just, the compromise was too great. The economy and the land, giving that away and keeping the government, which is now absolutely corrupt. It was just too great. It was too great. On international news, um, a South African global a uh, retail company is under investigation for accounting fraud uh, by German authorities. Um, I know. So uh, this is a retail company that owns more than 40 brands in 30 different countries. That's how big it is. Um, so Marcus Uester, who's the former CEO, resigned amid all this drama. Uh, he wrote... A letter to his employees saying that um, he made big mistakes 
which is euphemism for he is corrupt to the core and was running a Ponzi scheme. Um, yeah, so the company lost about 150 billion rands within a period of three days. Um, the PIC, which is the Public Investment Corporation, which invests on behalf of civil servants in South Africa, lost about 13.5 billion rands within a period of three weeks. Um, this is absolutely insane. Like, it's absolutely crazy. We could speak about this from different angles. The fact that the South African pub, uh, private sector is corrupt. I mean, we had kpmg there was mckinsey i mean it's just crazy that all these companies within uh the private sector are rotten um but we could also speak about the fact that um the government might have to foot the bill um of the pic because it stands as surety um when the pic invests on behalf of civil servants um this is insane i guess my biggest question, however, is just that, so the PIC uh, lost 13.5 billion rands, right? And then within a period of three days, uh, Steinhoff lost um, 150 billion. So then my question is then, what happened to this money? Like, like I get that it apparently disappeared, but, and it's lost, but like... <laughs> Does someone else have this money? Like, what, what happens to this money? And this is something that, like, confuses me about the stock exchange in general. Is that, apparently, um, you know, the stock had this much value. And then all of a sudden, the, the stock plummets and the money is lost. But this money did exist, right? So then, what happens to this money when it... It's apparently lost. So I went and I asked Google. And Google was like to me, no, girl. Actually, this money goes into thin air. Because it was just a value of stock. Um, it was never a medium of exchange. And I'm like, that does not make any sense at all. That does not make any sense. Because if the PIC uh, cashed its investment, then it would have gotten the 20 billion rands, right? But then now this money is lost and you're telling me it's disappeared. No one else got this money in the process. So then that means that this was money created out of thin air. Hence, it can go back and become thin air again. Doesn't that then make the, the stock exchange pretty dodgy and like a Ponzi scheme because then, you know, value comes and then it disappears? I don't know. Unless I'm missing something here. But this is very dodgy, the fact that money can just disappear into thin air and no one gains that money in the process. I mean, if someone would gain that money in the process, that would make sense. But the fact that it goes poof, thin air, no one knows where this money is. It just disappears. Is that not dodgy? I mean, I, that is very dodgy. It's very dodgy. <laughs> That was Political Quickie this week. My name is Mapa Sakamura. Go out there and uh, use your talents to serve humanity. I love you guys a lot and I will see you next week.